Welcome to Renaissance Charge Videos. I'm Rick Friedrich. And today we're going to ask the question, what is the context of radiant energy? Because we've talked about that recently. This is a continuation of um, two videos ago, which was about Bearden's uh, talking about Bearden, uh, Bedini's negative resistance in the battery and related subjects. So I said I'm going to go over this further. I very much hesitated to do this <laughs> and I'll explain why in a minute but um, I guess the main reason is I'm going to be showing a book that almost none of you have ever heard of. Just a little book. <laughs> I think it's 600, supposedly 666 pages or something. It's called Declassified Patents of the Cold War and SDI Companion Study Guide for the Secrets of Cold War Technology. Now these you can get, at least this one from Borderlands. I got this some years ago. They should still sell it and it's they're both by Jerry Vassilados and he's a very good storyteller um, he was a scholar um, in relation to the patents and um, part of the Borderland team and this was from 1996 so The thing about this book, 1997 it was published. So he starts off in the um, prologue. This is a very small print, letter sized pages. He talks about how evil these patents are. So I've had some quite have some hesitation as to recommending the reading of this because this is about how to do the worst things this world has ever conceived of doing. Nevertheless, he decided to publish the information, which I'm going to read some of the beginning portions pertaining to radiant energy. He decided to publish this because it was useful information in a different context. So now, many of you have read the first chapter of this book, of know of it, but this, this book was prior to the Secrets of Cold War. This was done in 2000, three years later. Now people tend to say more at the beginning than at the end unlike me <laughs> well I said a lot more things than I can even get into on these videos on the forums years ago but so what I want to do is quote these going to be all quotes from this book in the early pages after the prologue he's got a commentary which is really 60 pages almost or so and then there's a uh, bibliography that gets into this that he refers to. At least the names. Now this is the most advanced information you'll ever have access to because it was formally classified. And how he found it was by accident and there's many such things hidden in plain sight. He found it through some other research, I guess it was on um, submarines or something, and then he realized, I think, the, the dates that they were actually granted, applied granted, but they were not available till later, so I guess that realized, he realized then that that they were classified and there was indications within them of having gone through that 
process. Anyway, the point is I want to get into not that part of it because it's dealing with communications and weapon systems, which we're not going to get into those beyond the communications in the most basic sense. So what he said was these are declassified because they're way beyond this now. I don't know. So let's go into it. This is dealing with a superior radiation technology. So radi uh, radiant technology, radiant um, energy has a very specific context in the free energy community, specifically the Dollard, Bearden, Bedini camps. And um, the, the most extensive thing that you'll find on it is in this book right here. Now this book is about the same size, but it goes off into all sorts of other matters. Now, this book also, and I'll be talking about certain things in here that are going off into really interesting phenomena. Um, but this book gives some more detail that is not in this book. So if you really want to learn this stuff, you have to learn the context. That's why this video is called Context. So what we're going to start off with and I'm going to jump around. I'm not going to really go back and forth, but I'm just going to jump over many things. I'm not going to quote this whole thing. It's going to be a long video. It's 11 pages. Now this is big font, so I can read it properly. <laughs> and I might stop and make some comments here and there, but it speaks for itself. Because ultimately we're going to get into the Tesla effect, which is what he talks about here specifically and here I'm going to kind of pave the way for that not just state the end conclusion but kind of develop your mind and get to realizing context because I don't think that anybody um, who hasn't studied that time period realizes in the Victorian era really what was going on if you study the book on um, well, what's it called? The one on really the dangers of electricity. Um, oh, I just escapes me the name of it. Anyway, it goes into the whole history of electrical usage, and it talks about um, all all the way up to the present day how electrical phenomena has caused so much illness. I'm just trying to think of the name right now, but doesn't matter but if you start getting into the times and you realize oh it wasn't just you know a hundred years ago that we, we started using electricity in the American culture um, that it was very much involved for you know a much longer time period before that so what is radiant matter so we're dealing with superior radiation technology in this whole book. And um, this is going to go way beyond anything you've ever heard. Um, now some of you might have gotten into this, but I don't know. So I trust that you will really appreciate this anyway. So the methodology and true history of beam ray technology properly begins with the Egyptians. Mounted on natural plateaus and mountainous peaks, large diameter disks or highly maneuverable, maneuverable silver disks effected the exchange of meaningful messages and helps um, modern minds to rationalize and comprehend how the large kingdoms were joined. So they communicated, you can see on, maybe on the tops of the pyramids or whatever, they communicate signals, right? 
So this is the beginning of beam ray technology using the solar to reflect. So again, compressing by the, the disc. And then on behalf of the Athenian city-state, Arch Archimenides of Syracuse, 2000, or 247 BC, applied the Egyptian mirror technology to warfare. He was the archetypal inventor in whose control the living solar energies were wrangled into death rays. These aren't my choice of words, but I'm reading it. Until the 19th century advent of electrical science, beam ray communication techniques largely relied on natural sources of light and flammable media. And another form would be a lighthouse. So it's giving a signal from a distance, get you through the fog or whatever, show you where the land is so you don't run into it. Anyway, I just jumped over a whole bunch of different things that he mentions here because that's not my ultimate goal, is to read that part. Electrostatic, okay, so radiant matter. Not radiant energy yet, radiant matter. Electrostatically induced luminesc luminescence was observed when a mercury-filled uh, barometer was accidentally shaken, the vacuum space giving an eerie blue-green light, 1630. So Baron von Reichenbach assist, asserted that highly stressed materials, magnets, mineral chemicals, or crystals, chemicals, metals, and plants, were focal points of a universal energy which he termed odd light. Now odd, I think, is, is short for odilic force. Now, I talked, I had a whole series on this going back by Asa Mahan and his book, books on that subject, which are very fascinating. Some of these books I publish. So Baron Karl von Reichenbach was, and his neurosensitives in 1850, observed the strange and similar multispectral phosphorescence of magnets crystals, chemicals, and pure elements in special dark rooms. Bet you didn't know that. He observed the large volume rainbow, rainbow displays of light which surrounded electrostatic charges, displays with greatly exceeding those lights normally associated with electrical action. In addition, Reckenbach found that magnets extended a strong rainbow phosphorescence when poised in evacuated containers. All right. He observed that the luminous colors actually grew in strength and volume with increasing vacuum. So the more vacuumed it was. This he took as proof that the wavering rainbow colorations of aura aurora phenomena were produced by high aerial magnetic discharges of odd light. Of course, there's a lot of speculation on that. But this is where it's all kind of beginning, or well, at least that we know of in modern times. Sir William Crookes, 1875, who I mentioned in the previous video, who was a great mentor to Tesla, this greatest mentor, he undertook his detailed, methodic, and now classic investigation in order to test the odd light theory on electrostatic charge in a high vacuum. So he took it to another 
took kind of more random experiments, less organized, and made them more organized, and brought his very skilled scientific mind to the subject. According to theory, vacuum represented infinite resistance to the actual flow of charge. I'm going to say these things slow because you've got to hear each detailed word that slow. And you can find this and look at it, but I'm kind of stressing things so that you don't miss it. I read over this and I missed a bunch of things because your mind wanders and you have to write it out, underline it. To me, I wrote it out in the way I was going to speak on it, so it absorbs in. <laughs> I mean, this is not new for me, but some of the details you might forget. So, he therefore expected that a rainbow display would flood the tube from end to end, just as Baron von Reichenbach described had been observed in open air. A series of marvelous electrical discharges um, were pro produced in the globe. Within these relatively high vacuum were seen smoky blue fluidic threads which continuously wavered and intertwined. He perceived how the behavior of these odd light threads might have been influenced from an outside agency, movements highly suggestive of external control. Because they think, remember, they're thinking very basic of the phenomena of electricity. Now they're exploring what other things are involved, right? So he's trying to prove this out. Maybe there's more to it than what we've been thinking, right? Seeking access to the deepest vacuum states available, states which greatly exceeded the vacuum of all previous apparatus, he began observing strange phenomena which had never before been viewed. The progressive extension of a strange black cathodic radiance was observed with increasing stages of evacuation. Black, black, black. A presence which forced the luminous gas towards the anode. Crookes greatly wished to know the exact composition of this black radiance and why it was able to drive off the luminosity in his tubes towards the anode. Have you ever seen anything like that? Maybe you find a video on YouTube somewhere, who knows? At certain critical vacuum stages, Crookes could see the wavering threads of black radiance merging with luminous threads of the anode, a very defined organic nature being revealed. He suggested that these fluttering, thready emanations were highly purified odd light phenomena, made stronger than the ordinary electrical discharges by the evacuation process. This black radiant space seemed to drive the remaining luminescent gas out of the vessel with ex ex excessive evacuations, finally flooding the entire globe. The highest stages of evacuation, the entire glass globe fluoresced with an apple green color. The spreading black radiant glow was believed by Sir William to be a pure odd energy one which actually preceded the appearance of the odd light phenomena, all right? It preceded. He strongly believed that this was strange evidence of a space distributed ectoplasm, a space filling living energy had been both purified and fractioned into clarified view. Within his high vacuum globes, Crookes believed that he had effectively contacted the world of spirit, a portal of access into um, ethereal, 
unearthly world. Or eth ethereal, sorry. <laughs> the A always throws me off when I say it. Now, you can believe differently from him or whatever. His views concerning the metaphysical currents following, flowing through his globes were never accepted by the Royal Society, of course. To appease their inert view of the world, Crookes induced dialogue on the material nature of the cathodic rays. These, he stated, were streams of ultra-gaseous particles which moved through evacuated vessels at extreme velocities. Crookes designed several tubes by which the internal flow of black cathodic energy could be bent and made to impart or impact the walls. This quantitative analysis attracted the attention of his royal of his society followers. A study which later produced a regime of beam ray apparatus and particle accelerators. He reported the observation of a mysterious and penetrating heat which flowed from the black radiant space beyond the blunted wanes of his modified study tubes, or wans, I guess. These were effects which could be felt at quite a distance. Indeed, glass at these blunted ends seemed to pressured, even to the po melt melting point. Crookes also observed strange phenomena which actually revealed the unity between phenomena taking place within his globes and those anomalies which now took place throughout his laboratory. Sir William observed electrophosphorescent action both inside and outside his globes. The black radiant streams mode or sorry made chemicals and minerals glow. Many cited the possibility that the tubes were projecting a chemically active radiance in deep ultraviolet spectrum. Nevertheless, Sir William could not account for the continual fogging of photographic plates which he had stored in special dark cabinets. So he rejected the idea of the ultraviolet. This is what he'll talk about in a minute. Each experiment with the discharged tubes ruined his sensitive plates, which were somewhere else in his cabinet, right? Crookes delivered a discourse before the Royal Society on these phenomena, his famed Matter in the Four State, 1879. If you haven't re read him on radiant energy, then you don't know the basis of Tesla technology. And this book will prove that in a second. But in keeping with his qualitative foundations, Crookes later described a visionary system of communications by which such globes and their rays could be utilized to signal through great distances, 1890, the year before Tesla really got started. Here we find, well, around the same year, really. Here we find the first recorded instance in which such a system is both described and afforded the possibility of construction. This is where Tesla is following his every word from his first knowledge of him in back in the homeland um, was he was following him from early on. So he was right on it immediately. So the next point, dark rays. Discovered throughout the 19th century, several varieties of various dark radiant energies were continually chronicled these made their appearance in several distinctly different circumstances. To his already monumental discoveries, Reichenbach added a final triumph of his odd theory. By successfully producing a remarkable series of photographic exposures, he demonstrated hard evidence of the existence of odylic energy. Now in Mahan's paper or books, 
he talks about going around investigating these people that had these powers to move things, even wooden objects. And, and they were always considered people that were possessed, but he found that there was a scientific explanation and it was the idolic force. Very fascinating information. Um, and I won't get into the details because we'll go into the other details here. Such exposures that he found in those photographic exposures poised magnets and large crystals several inches from photographic plates, a very large focusing lens or concave mirror often being used to intensify the strange eternal light. It was found that the odd light required no lenses, the smoky projections passing from source to plate through tiny pinholes. These photographic methods set the stage for all the successive discoveries made in subsequent years in the 19th century. He produced true aurora photographs, images of plants and human hands made with no other than their natural odd light. These photographic exposures were later reproduced by Dr. Albert Abrams. Following the work of Kilner, a certain Parisian, uh, Dr. Lewis used photosynthesizing baths of hydroquinine sorry, in order to produce aura photographs from the bodies of his patients. His discovery revealed the absence of strong auric emanations from paralyzed portions of the body. So I know people that do this kind of research today on the health side. Some of you maybe listening are some of those people. Professors Anthony Professor Anthony discovered the penetrating power of sparks. I'm jumping ahead here. Perforating glass plates with high voltage discharges, 1872. Scientific investigators had successively produced very mysterious photographs, skiographs, or shadowgraphs, as they were then called. Electroshock images were routinely discovered by Reese and others. I don't need to mention them all. These electro photographs, sometimes referred to as inductor scripts, were made in various configurations with static shocks were applied to fine lycopodium dust, sulfur, um, diatomaceous earth, <laughs> I don't even know how to say it, chemicals, chemical gels, and photographic emulsions. The shock emanations from these electrostatic discharges pass through fairly thick, close contact layers of different substances, evidencing that many of these their formations were due to anomalous rayic emanations. The careful examination of these historical transcripts in here and elsewhere offers the devoted student insight into the vast reservoir of yet understood, misunderstood world energies. The manner, well actually he's referring to the bibliography in this book at the end of this section. The manner in which the plates were shielded whether in lead, tin, or thick organic layers, makes it quite clear that the greater portion of such mystery light emanations were neither infrared or ultraviolet energies. They therefore remain worthy of modern re-examination. These accounts are important in our development of beam ray technology because they chronicle the vast reservoir of natural energies which had been discovered and forgotten, energies which yet may offer humanity a wonderful new avenue into deeper mysteries of the biodynamic world. And so this is where people who 
have their little theory in a box and don't allow for any other theories are going to miss out on the real world. Now getting into Nikola Tesla, next section. Any discussion of radiant energy technology necessarily begins with Nikola, Dr. Nikola Tesla, whose legendary work on rays and beam rays form the early and most formative origins of all subsequent radiation devices. It is imperative that we review his discoveries since the forgotten fund of Teslian science offers humanity the most clarified corridor toward achieving most of the modern technological quests. Teslian technology actually secured a wide range of potentials now thought impossible with real technology. In fact, the Teslian methods could not yet obtain the means by which most technologically produced environmental hazards may be entirely eliminated. In a single accidental find, Tesla secured the means by which a completely distinct kind of energy could be channeled. The phenomena accompanying, accompanying this distinct energy have yet to be reproduced in the main, mainstream. Those methods by which Tesla achieved his famed phenomena, conventionally impossible effects which he consistently demonstrated for a great many qualified observers, have not been viewed as special and distinct by contemporary research groups. Those who believe themselves in possession of better technologies have not been successful in reproducing the distinctly penetrating Teslian effects, those which render no harm to society when released. The attainment of more potent radiant effects than those achieved through Teslian methods have apparently never been successful. Reacher, researchers who saw interpretation of his achievements through particle beam systems found themselves engaged with lethal forces requiring excessive radiation shields. Everything is always by force, and always meant to hurt people. The discoveries of Tesla properly begin after his development of polyphase technology. Now this is 1889-1991 is really the start. He's experimenting and then he starts getting public in 91 about it. Tesla discovered a radiant electroshock phenomena, the study of which eventually compelled him to abandon alternating current technology altogether. Tesla discovered this effect while performing experiments of violently disruptive capacitor discharges. The, radi the radiant electroshock phenomena de demonstrated the instant development of sensible shock and pressure effects at great distances from the apparatus. Its effects could be sensed right through copper plates. An obvious violation of simple electrodynamic laws. When wires were connected to his discharge device and immersed in oil baths, Tesla found that the focus pressure effect could produce strong gaseous fountains. And he showed, that, as you can see, some kind of black and white images of these in the first three main lectures. 91, 92, 93, 18, 91, 92, 93. Tesla concluded that the effect was a new stato static electric force and immediately set about studying its aspects to the exclusion of all other research. In its strongest manifestation, Tesla generated and used only explosive impulses. Explosive unidirectional capacitor sparks held the secret. All right, not alternating. This is not your Tesla coil that you buy anywhere. You can't buy these Tesla coils, right? Unidirectional capacitor sparks held the secret. Now, when I say you can't buy them, you can't buy them as we'll describe here. Tesla sought means for producing steady 
successions of these explosive spark discharges, a means by which a sustained radiant effect could be secured. Right? Now we talked about an effect in the batteries, which Bedini called radiant energy. Now we're going to get more into the primer, primal subject. The very fact that these electrified sound waves could sting human beings at a distance indicated that the powerful radiant em em emissions of electrical power from, are from his apparatus. Tesla conceived and demonstrated a small system for the radiant distribution of electrical power, one which would supplant his own wired polyphase system. Next section, pulsations. His problems were manifold. How to reduce the potential lethal string stinging shocks and how to raise the intensity of the radiant shock power Critical to the manifestation of this effect was the unidirectional discharge, one directional. It's not DC because DC is steady state. It's before the DC becomes DC. It's one directional, but it's an impulse. A condition requiring specific resistance capacitance relationship. I should read that again. The criti critical to the manifestation of this effect was the unidirectional discharge, a condition requiring specific resistance capacitance relationships. Right? You had to have the conditions in place for this to happen. Only properly configured discharge systems would produce the electroradiant effect. Through a revealing series of experiments, Tesla found that the radiant shock effect contained light-like light -like rays which were projected from the spark core. While spark intensity was the critical factor in projecting sufficient power from his apparatus, Tesla discovered that the duration of each spark per pulse produced different kinds of diff distant effects. His development of various mechanical switches gave him certain control over the pulsation brevity. When the spark pulsations were shorter than 50 microseconds, the stinging pain disappeared. Tesla then devised a magnetic arc disruptor, one which was the thrusting force of a strong magnetic field to pulse an explosive DC arc discharge. By adjusting the magnetic intensity of the gap and the electrical capacity of the primary circuit, Tesla was able to selectively modify the duration of each discharge. Tuning here. Tesla discovered that the like the light-like rays projecting from his magnetic disruptor were, capa were capable of producing strange and distant effects on human sensation and matter, a spectrum of rayic effects never before observed. Decreased impulse duration produced pressure effects penetrating heat, room luminescence, and cool breezes. But another observation stimulated Tesla to greater realizations, those which led to the center of our discussion. The powerful magnetic field of this disruptor visibly thrust the bright blue arc completely out of the spark channel. The blue is gone. What does that mean? And that was its intended function. But Tesla observed a brilliant white fluidic stream which continued to flow between the poles, completely uninfluenced by the magnetism. So what does that mean? One thing was stopped and another thing went through. 
Do you find that in your experimentation? <laughs> the white streams. This white stream of light was not merely composed of highly thermal electrons, otherwise it would have been more powerful thrust out of the discharge. Throbbing and pulsating in rhythm with the disrupted arc, this luminous white stream was responsible for all the strange effects which, we ha which he had been observing. A new current species had been fractioned and isolated. Tesla had discovered an entirely different species of electric current, one which required the explosively violent electrical discharge for its stimulation. That's what it had initially required. So when Tesla speaks of current, you have to understand him in context. Because once he started this path, he largely referred that to this phenomenon but he did use it interchangeably so it could be ambiguous but you should know it by the context Tesla devised special fractioning apparatus in order to separate this white luminous current from the commonly known electrical current which is electrons indeed this bright white fluidic energy is that upon which Tesla relied for the production of all his legendary effects, a fact which has eluded and baffled researchers since his first announcements. So even, just as it is in our day, it was the same in his day. You will not find Tesla coils that are made according to Tesla's way of doing it. Very few. Tesla demonstrated the two distinct currents present in explosive sparks through several demonstrations. These each cleverly showed the distinction between electron currents and white currents. <coughs> one, in one experiment, Tesla used, now pay attention to this, he used a U-shaped bar, which my friend called the hairpin, <laughs> the hairpin circuit, across which several carbon filament lamps were connected. Stimulated by the etheric currents of his transformers, guess this, you missed this one, the copper bar became hot with electron currents while the lamps became brilliant with cold whiteness. Now we can see the same thing when you think of the coil. When we put a lamp across the coil, it's exactly the same as Tesla's bar. So we can see the same effect just with our coils and our motors. So this is why it was probably called radiant energy by John in this context. But notice that about the, the bar actually being hot. When most people run this, they are running a different kind of experiments where they're not getting the bar hot. Side point. His development of special white current transformers provoked the intensification of projected rays beyond all exceptions. These transformers raise electrostatic tensions beyond all commonly accepted values, manifesting a strange non-magnetic induction phenomena, which surprisingly few could accept. The radiant streams over which Tesla had strict priority were electrically neutral and did not respond to magnetic fields. Get that. Very important. Tesla found that white currents fluidically wiggled over the surface of smooth single layer coils. He was unable to measure the amperage on the coil itself. Or there was no amperage. <laughs> That's what we get into when we talk about the Tesla effect in this later book. 
that we cut off the current flow and we get the the radiant and that's where we get in the engineering so while okay he was unable to measure the amperage on the coil itself while developing electrostatic tensions exceeding several million volts and you can say oh well that's all volts and no amps well if you saw his system you'd think otherwise <laughs> White currents were absolutely harmless in passage through the human body, while handheld metal bars simply vaporized. <laughs> the passage of the white currents through metals obviously produced charges, while passage through carbonous matter apparently did not. The fact that white current passage through certain metals produced electrostatic charge was a phenomena which formed the very basis of his broadcast power system. His numerous experimental evidences were seldom comprehended. comprehended. The dual current species not having been adequately comprehended or appreciated by most of the academic community all except Crookes and a few German researchers because Crookes actually had one of his models and apparently it was the only one doing this phenomena in all of Europe <laughs> if no. anyway radiant energy now produced by purified streams of the mysterious white currents right so they're two different things radiant energy Tesla transformers became true transmitted transmitters of the radiant force white currents radiant force giving homage to his mentor Sir William Cooks Tesla termed these transmissions radiant energy broadcasts most engineers imagine incorrectly that this transmission mode required the agency of a long antenna. In other words, they view the Tesla transformer as a generator harmonically altering high frequency current. Oh, all we're doing is having a resonance process that is alternately harmonically. They are wrong. True Tesla transformers are pulse transformers. Furthermore, they do not pulsate with electrical energy. They pulsate with white currents. The radiant shocks pulse outward into space like successive shells of light, penetrating rays which require a simple ball antenna for efficient transmission. The rays can project outward from the large spherical terminals and powerfully produce a flood of electrostatic charges on contact with metals a phenomena which had previously been observed but misunderstood by Thompson in 1872 surmounted with copper spheres the specific volume the transmitters produced uh, with of specific volume, the transmitters, transmitters produced white fluidic near zone discharges and far zone electrostatic power effects. This discharge brilliance was a condition which Tesla greatly wished to suppress. Besides focusing the radiant energy on a truly spherical distribution throughout surrounding space, the discharge streamers actually damped the effective transmitted power. Discharge streamers were not desired by Tesla, representing power drainage at the source. Even at this early stage in development, and despite dampening effects of random streamers, numerous anomalies began to be noticed. Using geyser tubes in place of incandescent lamps, Tesla calculated that far more power was appearing at a distance than was actually supplied to the transmitter. 
Yet Tesla found that the flow of power to distant appliances often exceeded that which he was supplying from his high pressure terminals, an impossible condition. Right? This is the whole purpose of my kits. Well, the first kit. He was able to provide more than enough energy at a distance to bring specifically designed motors and lamps to full operation performance. This feat was especially easy to accomplish when the transmitters were grounded. Indeed, Tesla found that the radiant energy transmitters were not propelling charge through space at all. Tesla observed that the radiant energy was producing charges only when impacting metal objects. Now, get that. According to the Resonance 2 kit that I've put out recently, this is a big part of that chapter 2. When we're, we're shuffling around charges with the atmosphere on an antenna which had much uh, surface area with the ambient. So whenever this mysterious force brought whatever this mysterious force brought through space, its principal essence was not electrical. This strange and penetrating radiance produced charges only on contact. So in a way this is going through ground but in a way through the air. So that's kind of a mystery to, for you to think about. Tesla very gradually comprehended that the radiant energy was simply stimulating a much larger atmosphere of energy. One resident throughout space. The white currents which he had generated separated and intensified held the secret. Tesla showed that white currents could pass through most matter unhindered. White currents were believed by Tesla to be currents of an ultra-gaseous species, an etheric gas, which was discussed by Crookes and predicted uh, by, by Mendela, who described the etheric atmosphere as consisting He's the one who gave us the periodic table, right? As consisting of several distinct elements, noble gases, very much higher than hydro lighter than hydrogen, which flooded all space. So not maybe so much a material ether as much as a gaseous ether. Tesla considered that the fluidic stream, which had successfully been fractioned, from the violent chaos of his magnetic disruptor was a purified stream of ether gas. He had intimated this in his very first publication on the electroradiant phenomena, referring to the effect as taking place entirely in the andium, ambient medium, composed of particles very much smaller than electrons themselves. This white etheric current produced characteristic phenomena completely unlike those familiar to electrical science. The Tesla transformer was like no other apparatus, producing a stream of throbbing non-electric etheric currents. Tesla could skew the polarities of his transformer, causing the etheric currents to move outward from the high tension terminal or inward from all directions in space. So you could have it divergent or convergent. This latter feature greatly intrigued Tesla, who recognized the space permeating nature of the etheric atmosphere. The etheric atmosphere filled all space. Therefore, energetic stimulations were sufficient to set this atmosphere in motion. Aether, ether evidenced a motion, momentum unlike observed when matter was set in motion. And we talked about that before some applications of that. Ether required only a window through which to move. Therefore, thereafter, its own pressure would sustain 
the stream momentum. That's important. Tesla realized that his transmitters were stimulating the very ether, setting in motion the enormous potentials at a great distance. Ether engines. He designed a special transmitter for the express purpose of setting ether from space into motion. The magnifying transmitter. which paves the way for the second part of this book and the certain ray that I won't mention. Anyway, the, the motion, I was talking about that in a previous video of doing a demonstration, which I've never gotten around to doing along those lines uh, for my meetings. I mean, depending on the impulse rate and the material composition of insulators, white currents were found able to pass through electrical insulators. So you can't, in polarization, electrons do not pass through, but here the white currents were. And we talked about quorum in the book, the second kit's book, where you have these lightning balls literally coming through a window, which is an insulator. Here was evidence of their fundamental superiority as energetic species. Ether currents never passed through metal conductors without producing significant electrostatic charges, these appearing most powerfully at his transmitted terminals. So this is a problem and it's a benefit. So depending on your context. The high tension was produced not by the etheric currents, but by the rapid accumulation of electrostatic charge. So make your careful distinctions. For those of you who haven't even got this far in this video, I will say this video and these kind of this kind of information is for those who want details, who want to do real science, who don't want to just have the light switch. So you have to make these careful distinctions here. There's a difference between the cause and the effect, the, the white uh, ether currents and the resulting electrostatic charge on the, the metal. And that's how everything is actually charged. Every circuit in the universe is actually powered in the same way, according to Bearden's paper that I read the other day. But this particular effect is more noticeable as visual that you can see with the white. And before I forget to mention it, he already talked about going through the body, not affecting the body. Now, I I've shown these pictures at my meetings of actual photographs taken from Tesla's day of people um, that were on, like it, the, the radiant white light was coming off of them at very high voltage. And they were, and there was even a, bur a, uh, a bunny, a rabbit that was, um, got used to it and liked it. <laughs> anyway, that's another story. Tesla observed, or let's go back. The density of the metal resistances always resulted in a dramatic and rapid concentration of electrostatic charge, a process which choked etheric currents. So get that. I've said this for years many, many, many times. In the presence of current and regular electron flow, you have the cancellation of this phenomena. So this is a very difficult thing to do when you are trying to drive a motor, for example, with an inductor, so this is where you have a very short pulse 
where current does not flow and you create the effect. This is the Tesla effect. We call it the Tesla effect because when you call something after somebody's name, it was the crowning thing, their crowning achievement. So Don Smith called his Don Smith effect one thing, and other people call it there's a something effect, and the Tesla effect is this very point. So we don't let the current flow if we want the continuation of this phenomena to flow. So we'll have to deal with this uh, charge in the proper way, which took Tesla all of 10 years and all these patents and processes to perfect this whole thing, as he later talked about. Um, so this is not something you sit down five minutes and just slap together. Um, so it choked the etheric currents. So when you have the electrostatic charge as a result of these going through the metal, then it stops the effect from happening. So you have to start over again. However, if you don't have that, then you can continue it to flow, as I just read a couple of paragraphs back. Ether currents never tunneled into and through metals. Ether currents fluidically flowed around metals. Here was a progressive lesson which led to the new technology which Tesla finally perfected. Now this is where we say this effect takes place all around the conductors. So the bigger the surface area, the more the conductors pick up a charge. The bigger the surface area of the batteries, the more this fluid goes around those surface areas, creating a charge, which Bearden talks about in a different way. So, um, the mere passage of etheric current necessarily inferred energetic mechanical bombardment of the conductive medium. Metals represented a special class of elements which offered more resistance to the passage of etheric gas. Etheric bombardment of metals resulted in charge formation. While metals were best able to conduct electrical charge, they would not conduct ether streams, but they could be energized by them. You have to make the distinctions. These dynamics were recognized in his transmitters. The insidious source of certain efficiency losses in transformation. <coughs> the very metal of his transmitters provided an effectively dense target for an etheric bombardment effect that takes place. This bombardment converted back some of the etheric radiance into charges in the very moment of transformation, a discharge of brilliant white streamers. These streamers contain deadly components, electrostatic charges of unexpected potential. Sometimes lethal sparks often were unexpectedly discharged into the surrounding space and were responsible for near tragic accident which occurred early in this research. Tesla replaced the copper ball antennas with low pressure gas filled bulbs. Solution here. Finding that these safely projected etheric radiant energy far with far greater purity and efficiency. In this method, the darkly spark had the deadly spark hazard was largely eliminated. The use of these glass-filled globes promoted the development of a new regime of technology, that which led directly to our central discussion topics. Should I end there? Very special radiation is the next topic. Most Tesla students find this period of his research to be somewhat separate and radically different from that which engaged the development of wireless power broadcast systems 
and of geophysically coupled broadcast stations. But this is a misconception brought about by lack of information. Tesla accidentally discovered that vacuum tubes could actually extend the efficiency of his wireless power broadcast system in a most remarkable and unexpected manner. The accidental production of several bizarre shadow graphs occurred in the Tesla Research Laboratory at 33, 35 South 5th Avenue. The year was 1894. While using this gas filled, his glass filled globes as photographic illuminators, strange prints convinced the photographer that something was awry. awry. The peculiar characteristics of these gaseous lumps produced portraits which included the internal mechanisms the camera of the camera in use. The internal mechanisms. <laughs> Tesla recognized that the etheric currents had achieved a, point, a potent degree of penetration after passage through the gas-filled globes. The strange trans transparency of ordinary obstructive material captivated Tesla. The dim portrait of his friends appearing among clockwork gears and lens castings <laughs> Tesla had not seen this effect with copper ball antennas. Tesla evidently replaced the gaseous bulb terminals with high vacuum carbon button lamps. Having found that these conveyed etheric for force effects with greater purity and far less hazard. It was in conjunction with the implementation of these vacuum tubes that Tesla made his second greatest discovery that which we will now detail. His experiments with carbon button vacuum lamps revealed that a remarkable intense increase in intensity of broadcast power was being affected. The rapidly pulsating flashes of energy could pass through walls unhindered. Tesla found it a simple matter to broadcast both coded and vocalized signals on this far spreading radiant emission. He experienced with the transfer of images through the radiant streams a strange magic lantern system capable of projecting whole images through walls. Phosphorescent screens retrieve the images however distant. The discovery of fundamental phenomena eradicating the excesses of technical manipulations. The Teslian form of television required no scanning systems whatsoever. This scheme was later revealed as a means for illuminating deeply submerged vessels of war. The Teslian submarine detectors has always been misinterpreted as a perimeter radar device. It's the most advanced as conceivable. That's what I said. Tesla began a new study of the white currents and their ability to powerfully project a single electrode immersed in hard vacuum. A new investigation now sought the exact nature of the etheric current, its composition, particle size, and other rare characteristics now revealed. The use of the vacuum tube as a, quant a conduit for his pulsating etheric currents truly revealed new and unexpected attributes. Recognizing the ultra gaseous stream which now flowed in powerful beams from his vacuum tubes, Tesla began performing a great number of tests to find out to find how better to purify the radiant streams. Tesla discovered that etheric currents lost their brilliance white colorations when applied to a high vacuum discharge tubes. Instead, a powerful black radiance flooded both the vacuum globe and then the entire laboratory space. In this intensified condition, one which greatly resembles conditions in interstellar space, Tesla learned more 
concerning the power of these etheric currents than in all of his previous years of research. Along with this clarified visual effect came certain defined sensations. When properly activated, these vacuum tubes, tube antennas, produce strong evolutions of physiological, emotive, and mental vitality. Tesla became obsessed with the notion that consciousness could be raised by such means. Uh, wrong. And it is strongly believed that Tesla primarily designed his Wardenclyffe system to achieve a worldwide transformation of these human parameters. A world broadcast of such energetic influence would dramatically increase human energy on a social scale. Human energy is a phrase originally coined by Albert Adams in 1902 and refers to the human aura. A new mode of conveying energetic conditions now promised magnific magnificent benefits for humanity. Very special radiation was the collective term which he gave to his new class of phenomena. I will pass, I won't pass off the um, point here that his whole the increasing problem of human energy um, which actually he's wrong in this because he actually wrote on that prior to 1902 I believe um, but anyway he wrote it earlier on and later expanded upon and that was one of the worst things he ever wrote and I would like to dissect that one day because there's numerous things that are very problematic and the whole idea that Tesla paved the way for is what we're facing now in the whole transhumanist problem. Um, so he was really a pioneer transhumanist and what we, he was trying to do there was jump ahead a hundred years of what they're trying to do now or they are succeeding in doing to some extent and modifying human behavior um, in a very bad sense. Anyway, but the point of the radiant matter is it relates to the ether or whatever what you want to call it and it's a whole different set of phenomena when you engineer it and we don't see any activity along those lines really. It's all private off the internet. So the only information you'll probably ever get now on the subject is in these books. So um, that's it for now. It's a long enough video. Thanks for watching.